Hey, everybody, it's Tommy Canelli, and welcome to Before the Lights Podcast, the show to find out how those in sports, music, and entertainment made their mark. He has been a guest on many major talk shows that include Oprah, CNN, and Good Morning America. An executive coach who's an 11 time New York Times best selling author and co author of 30 books. He's an award winning keynote speaker that is an NSA certified professional and a CSP leadership speaker. He's the CEO of 180 Communications and a Maxwell Leadership Thought Leader, along with being a Forbes Senior Contributor. Please welcome to the show, Don Yeager. Don, welcome to Before the Lights. Hey, thanks, Tommy. Gosh, listen to all that. I sound really old. I would so say I'm feel, experienced. I'm feeling old just listening to all that. <laughs> experienced. You were born and raised in Hawaii, also lived abroad in the Dominican Republic, Honduras, Japan, and Great Britain. Looking and reflecting back on all that, Don, how has that made you who you are today? Well, I don't think there's any question um, that uh, the travel, right? I, I'm a big believer in world travel and the importance of understanding and appreciating other cultures. And I think it it allows you to um, to be more grateful for, for the culture you do live in. Um, but I think it also allows you to appreciate uh, the challenges that others face. And I think that uh, those two, those two things were, were true gifts that my parents, um, my father was a preacher, Methodist preacher. And, um, uh, and so the idea that the two of them, my parents were able to kind of expose me to so much so young was, uh, was a true gift. Was there somewhere in all that, or did it come from your family? Where did the love of writing come into? Um, so I always enjoyed, uh, it, it's funny when we lived in Japan, uh, I had a paper route. I had a newspaper route. Uh, I delivered uh, the newspaper Stars and Stripes, which was the uh, the military newspaper, right? And um, uh, and so I would actually return home uh, every morning. My you know newspaper route started at six a.m. I'm back by seven, and uh, I would close the door to my bedroom. I would turn on a tape recorder because that's back when we actually had tape recorders. <laughs> And I would I would offer my opinions on the news. Mm. Uh, and now we're talking I'm in sixth grade, seventh grade, whatever it was. But but the discussion around the world and the, the dynamics of world politics and other things. My mother, um, my mother found some of those cassette tapes one day and and had them digitized for me. And it's a little embarrassing to hear that high <laughs> voice going. Richard Nixon was framed um, because you know that's just kind of what the military newspapers kind of carried as the uh, the story, and that's. Uh, but I was I was learning um, early just the I, I, the love of um, uh, and the respect and appreciation for curiosity was always big for me, and then from that, um, learning how to write kind of came came second. How does someone who's born and raised in Hawaii, travel abroad, end up at school in Indiana at Ball State? I mean, come on. Doesn't everybody around the world <laughs> want to go to Ball State if given the chance? It's, I mean, that's the challenge for Ball State is that they just, they, you know, they have to turn down so many in order to get to the few of us who, um, no, it, it, it just, it happened that uh, I, I finished my high school in Indiana. Mm. Uh, at uh, Lawrence Central High School in Indianapolis, and and Ball State was an opportunity for me not just to go and uh, and, and and get a Division One education, which was good, uh, but also to um, I, w- I had the opportunity to 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 work out with a football team with the hopes of maybe one day uh, trying to figure out how uh, how crippling the sport could be, and it didn't take me long to figure out <laughs> I was not. Uh, I, I wasn't going to be playing on Sundays anywhere and I need to focus <laughs> on education. So you graduate from ball state and then you become reporter with San Antonio light. And then you get into Dallas morning. looking back then, Don, what, if anything, did you take from those jobs that you're still using today? I, I think it was just a, um, a, again, I've used the word once already, and I'll, but I, I mean, it'll come up more than, more than that. I'm sure just a, complete curiosity. There was, there isn't anything that I'm not, that I'm not curious about. Uh, if I, if I don't know what it is, if I don't understand it, or 
and there's and obviously there's very little that I really understand. Um, most of it, uh, I'm just I want to understand the mind of other people. I want to understand what it means um, to be uh, to be exceptional, and um, uh, and and why are some people wired for it and others aren't? I'm constantly. Um, those, those are the questions. Those are the things that didn't matter where I was or who I was getting a chance to interview. If I could learn those kinds of details, that's where my, that's where my heart, um, really was. To this day, then my guess is you've taken something from everybody you've interviewed or written about and still learning today. Uh, Absolutely. I mean, I was working on a book project this morning with, uh, Rick Hendrick, the the owner of a, of a pretty famous NASCAR racing team and and the uh, proprietor of uh, an unbelievable number of car dealerships, and just constantly learning about the minds of of people who think bigger, larger than most of the rest of us. You spent several years with Sports Illustrated. You start as a freelance writer for them. You're then promoted, go full time, and end up becoming an associate director. Retired. Do you still associate do editor. associate editor? My, my apologies. Yeah. Do you still do any freelance writing with them? Uh, no, not with no. SI. No, they, um, uh, as, as things have changed for them, I mean, ownership has changed. They've, um, they've, they've, they now publish 12 times a year instead of 50. Um, I, you know, they just, they don't need as much content as they, as they did back in the day when I back it's, it's bad news when I I'm already like, this is my second <laughs> how old I am reference in this uh, conversation and we're only 10 minutes in, but uh, yeah, it, um, back in the day they needed, they needed content. And I loved, I loved chasing stories. What was the reason you decided to write your first book undue process, the NCAA injustice for all. So this is pre sports illustrated. I was working at a newspaper here in Florida and um uh, and part of my deal was the newspaper allowed me to take several months every year to work on a big project. And one year the project was, and given that you live in Vegas, you could appreciate this. The project was, I wanted to investigate the, the NCAA, uh, just like they investigated universities. Uh, it actually brought me to Vegas where I met Jerry Tarkanian, the, uh, the great basketball mm-hmm. coach at UNLV, where you were there when they won their national championship. Um, I, it, but it also, it exposed me to a lot of folks who, um, were looking for someone to hear them out, uh, with an op- with, with open ears about, um, what was a challenging relationship, the NCAA's relationship with college sports. And, um, and so I became that guy, I wrote this series of stories for the newspaper it ended up on an ABC evening news program. They were, they were fascinated by what I had uncovered and that led to my first ever book deal. And, um, you know, again, wasn't expected that that was going to be my route, but most people are, you, you have to be ready for the unexpected. If you're going to find a pretty incredible route, my good fortune is that book did really well. Um, it opened up a lot of doors for me and, um, uh, and, and, here I am, uh, 35 books later, um, which is pretty crazy. Did you always have aspirations to write a book or you just wanted to be a reporter? No, I really, I'd never thought about writing a book. I just wanted to, uh, I, I just want, I, I enjoyed the chase, mm. right, of stories. Um, the one thing I love about books is that it allows me to get deeper, right? I'm allowed, you know, where at a newspaper story, I might, you know, I might get, if I get a thousand words, it's a really good deal. Then you get a magazine piece. Maybe you get five or 6,000 words. Well, now I get to take 60,000 words and really dive into a subject and try to make every word count. And um, it's really, it's a great process. I love it. Doing some research. One of the things that I tipped my cap to for you and was delighted to read was in 2000, William Knack and yourself were finalists for the National Magazine Award for the cover story, Who's Coaching Your Kid? The Frightening mm-hmm. Truth Behind Child Molestation in Youth Sports resulted in changes to law in several states and youth organizations, including Little League of America, to require background checks of coaches and volunteers. I mean, without that, it's scary where we might be today. Yeah, I have to tell you, people ask every once in a while, 
what's the um what's the what's the most important story I've ever written, right? Kind of a thing. And and I go to that story, even though it's uncomfortable as heck to talk about, right? Nobody wants to talk about Mm-mm. sitting in jail cells, which I did with inmates who, you know, had been convicted of um uh, of you know, who had been umpires or coaches in little league games, but were looking for opportunities to try to take advantage of children and trying to understand the mind of those people. And, um, uh, and it just, but the idea that the story led to an appearance on Oprah Winfrey, uh, Oprah Winfrey show, which was in, which was enormous led to a bunch of other uh, media opportunities. And as you noted there, a number of States changed their laws as a result, 37 States total um, to require background checks. So to me, it, it may be the, the least comfortable story I've ever written, but, but I would argue the most important thing I've ever had a chance to be part of. Were you able to connect any dots amongst all these people sitting in jail on why? I mean, I remember I was sitting, I was sitting in one jail cell and uh, right there in Las Vegas, actually with a guy who, um, and I asked him about it and he, um, and it's funny because the young boy that was, um, that was taken advantage of and who's, who I, I featured um, in that story. And one of the people that was in that story is now a, a, um, a state trooper in North Dakota. And we stay in touch. I like was texting with him just last week. It was just crazy that I, I stay in, I try to stay in touch with people that who had great impact on my life. Like this young boy did because he trusted me with his story, which was crazy. Um, but what you, what that, that inmate told me was, you know, some people like blondes, some people like brunettes. I like boys. I mean, you know, he just, he, I, he, mm. he couldn't quite explain the, and, and in his mind, it wasn't even deviant, right? It was just, it was just his, his desire. And, I, you know, and, and the longer you talk, the more you realize that there was, this was not a logic conversation, right? This was a conversation that, that there's a there uh, I, I I couldn't ever get to the mind of because I, I I I can't imagine thinking like that. No, I agree with you. 2001, you co-authored biography on Walter Payton, Never Die Easy, mm-hmm. New York Times bestseller. You live with Walter and his family as he was dying. Don, what did you learn about Walter's legacy? Not of so much on the field but what he was leaving behind and how his family was. Mm. So I, I, this was maybe again, just one of those incredible opportunities. Like he was my hero. I mean, I wanted to be like everybody else. I wanted to be Walter Payton when I grew up. Right. Um, and so the idea that uh, I would be inv- invited by Walter to, to live there with him, to understand and to experience um what were his final weeks was, was really something else. But I would tell you the thing that was so special about him was that, you know, there's this old saying in, in sports, you should never meet your heroes because they'll almost assuredly let you down. Mm. Um, Walter uh, was the complete antithesis of that saying, like he was better in person than he was in my imagination of him Um, just constantly constantly thinking of others, you know, uh, just such important. And, and, and so I think the thing that really caught me about Walter, and again, I was there in this incredibly vulnerable period. He knew that the words he was giving me, uh, he would never read because he knew he would be passed by the time the book were to come out, which meant he had to fully trust that I was going to I was going to honor him in everything that I did. And, and so that became kind of this um, burden. I mean, weight, I don't want to call it burden because burden sounds negative. Weight is real though. Right. You knew that, that this guy who was so extraordinary and so important to so many people was absolutely trusting you and saying, you know, uh, do me right. Do, do, do my story. Right. And, um, but it was a game changer for me. Having done that uh, book with him changed my dynamic, my career completely uh, because so many other athletes in the years since then, even today, 
say, if Walter Payton trusted you, I'll trust you too. And, um, it, you know, it's amazing what one person's interaction with you can change, how it can change the direction of your life. And coming from somebody as high profile as Walter Payton, I don't know if there's anybody else out there that can carry that kind of weight. No, no, he, he was, um, he was one of the great gifts in my life and I love it. I'm still, in fact, I just recorded, I also have a podcast. Um, mm-hmm. I, I think I know we've talked about that or I know we will, but um, uh, and I just recorded a podcast with his two children uh, a couple of weeks ago. It will run uh, later, but it just was um, for me, just the constant ability to stay in touch with his family because I love who they became because of the leadership he showed um, the leadership. None of the rest of us would see because it was, it, it occurred in their household. It's fantastic. Outside of sports, also have written books on George Washington in 2013, Thomas Jefferson. Wait, George and- Washington was a great quarterback. You don't remember him? <laughs> incredible. I mean, when he, when he threw that, when he, when he, anyway, forget it. <laughs> Thomas Jefferson in 2015 and Andrew Jackson in 2017, you teamed up with Brian Kilmeade. Are you a history buff? I am. Okay. I was actually a history major in college. Okay. And so I love history. I love it. when Brian reached out to me about doing these projects, doing the first project together, which was about George Washington. Um, I, you know, my initial reaction wasn't like, this was out of my space. Like I, you know, we all, we all believe that you should, you have your space, stay there, get really good, you know, own that space. And Brian challenged me. He's like, you know, gosh, here you are, you're out as a public speaker. You're talking to people about, you know, uh, living beyond themselves, doing more of that. Da, da, da. He said, but, but here I'm offering you this chance to do the exact same thing and you're not taking it, you know? And I just, I realized he used my own words to, 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 to make me um, jump in on that, on the first project. And boy, am I glad I did. Um, each one of those books sold a million copies basically. So it was pretty crazy. Listeners, go to the show notes, donyeager.com. I'm going to put a link there. You can get your hands on not just one, but as many books as you would like. As Don said, he's my got over children 30 of would them. be grateful. I got to, <laughs> there's still, there's, they, 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 my son goes to high school next year. So I, I need, I need all the help I can get. We'll see if we can't push some more book sales for you. From everything that you have talked to people and learned and, and investigate and chase that story, have you come across or learned is love? A core value? Wow, that is a great question. I don't think I've ever thought of it as a core value, but it is. I mean, it is. It's uh, uh, because so many of the elements that, 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 that are melded together to create love, right? The mm-hmm. ability to respect, the ability to um, to offer your, to, to be authentic and offer yourself, um, are all, uh, yes, very core to what I would tell you are the great ones, right? The, those that I, I'm a big fan of studying, in fact, you know, I, I talk about greatness. What are the habits of the greats? And, um, yeah, love is, yeah, that's, that's a great question. I've never had it phrased that way, but I would, I would, I would say it's absolutely true. I appreciate that because as a former junior college basketball coach and being in a locker room, we spoke a lot about family and unity and love. And that was kind of one of our core values to do that. And also, maybe you can speak on this, the term of we versus me. Yeah, there's a, um, you know, there's, uh, it's, it's fun. I mean, right now we're in the middle or the early stages of the NBA playoffs and, Mm -hmm. I love, I love sports in all forms, but I, um, I, I watch differently than some people because I watch to look for, you know, uh, elements that allow some teams to be better than others. Right. And it's, you look at Boston versus Brooklyn, right? Brooklyn's got an incredible talent, but they seem to have very little chemistry when it really, when it really counts Boston, which has this, uh, the, the Celtics seem to have this really magical, um, at least in the moment, uh, uh, they, they've got great camaraderie and, um, 
uh, it's fun when you watch, the, but I'm watching for exactly that. And yes, I think that, that those kinds of core values really hold, um, are what pull some teams together and what never allow some teams to gel. I mean, you know, Kyrie Irving just has been talking about the fact that our team hasn't gelled yet. Well, yeah, there's a lot of reasons for that. And, uh, you know, at the end of a long season, if your team hasn't gelled, um, they, it don't don't blame it on lack of opportunity, right? Have you found one common factor among all the people you've written about, from George Washington and Thomas Jefferson to Jerry Tarkanian, Walter Payton, and so on? I have. I would tell you. I, I think the number one answer that I, that I offer when someone asks about a common trait is that at some stage in their life, every one of these people, and again, whether you're talking George Washington or, or, or Tark, right. Is it, they learn, they, they learn to hate losing more than they love winning. Um, the truly great ones kind of expect to be successful. They, they, they just kind of, they, there's almost a birthright nature to it. Right. Uh, I, I just believe that success is kind of where I'm, where I'm headed. Uh, but failure uh, they know what to do with it and they know how to, how to use it to their advantage. I love Nick Saban's line, right? Never, ne- never waste a good, ne- never waste a good loss. Um, he didn't lose very many. So uh, it's easy to, to have, to, to treat a loss as a, uh, as a learning opportunity, but that's what the great ones do. I've always said that a roadmap to success is hard work or elbow grease, and you have to learn along the way. But in your opinion, Don, does success leave clues behind it? I'm totally, I, I use that phrase all the time. Success leaves clues. And then it's our job, uh, anyone that wants to achieve at a higher level to go pursue the clues, right? How do we go find them? Um, how do we go look at people who are successful? How do we go find organizations that seem to be doing better than others? And um, in the process of, of looking at those organizations or those people, what clues can we take? What can we get from them? One, one person I would say that has stepped up in the public's eye, more so off the field than on, and I'd like to get your feedback on it, is Warwick Dunn. Wow. I got to tell you, I, I love this guy uh, so much. Uh, it, he, uh, he gave me the opportunity to write his book as well. Um. And uh, for those of your listeners who might not know who he is, he was a running back in the National Football League, um, but an extraordinary one. I mean, he, you know, he, he played 13 years in the league at 11,000 yards rushing and 5,000 yards receiving. So, I mean, those are just, those are superhuman numbers, but even better if you understand he's only 5'8 and weighs 178 pounds. Tiny guy. Um, played for my Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Yes. <laughs> And, um, he's, uh, extraordinary in so many ways, but one of them is that, you know, as a senior in high school, um, his mother, who was a police officer was shot and killed in a robbery at a bank. And, um, uh, which made Warwick, who was the oldest of six children, made him the man. I mean, he was the man of the house. There was no father. And so Warwick was forced into raising his children, his, his younger brothers and sisters, it's really incredible. Plays college football at Florida State, wins a national championship, goes to the Buccaneers as the 12th pick in the first round of the draft, which is incredible, right, uh, for a little guy. And immediately starts a charity in which he starts buying homes for women like his mother, um, single moms. And uh, this year at the Super Bowl, the 2022 Super Bowl in Los Angeles, or gave away his 200th home. 200 homes to single moms. Really? What are they? I mean, you know, God, oh. the guy is like everything you yes. ever want. But to finish his book, Warwick and I um, actually went to death row to meet the guy that killed his mom, mm. which is the most amazing hour in my life. Like if I could put one hour of life in a, in a capsule and say, that's it, it would be the hour in this cell on death row in Louisiana. Um, where the, the inmate started by denying that he had anything to do with it and coming up with all these new stories. And finally Warwick stopped him and said, look, I, 
I don't know why you came here today, but I came here today to forgive you. And it was just the most amazing thing I've ever seen a human do. Right. And, uh, it, uh, I'm, you know, guy, I get, I get choked up telling it every time I do, but, you know, watching Warwick do that was one of the most extraordinary things I've ever seen. Um, one of the greatest championship moments in, in my career that I've ever had the opportunity to witness. And, um, and it was so powerful when we left the, we left the prison, the warden actually grabbed Warwick and said, you know, one day, um, one day the appeals process will run out and we're going to execute this guy. And when we do, do you want to be here? And Warwick said, no, because as of today, because I have forgiven him, he holds no power over me any further. And I thought, wow. Wow. You know, we talk all the time about, about what does forgiveness really mean? What's it supposed to be? And when Warwick said that, I would just really, boy, pull it all in for me. One of the most incredible. Uh, he's just, my gosh, I like, I could, I could talk about Warwick done for hours. He's an amazing human being. Amazing. Yes. That's, uh, I think we're, we're even cutting him short, calling him that. But yes. Agree. You mentioned your podcast, Corporate Competitor, how sports shape today's business icons. Speak a little bit about the whole concept of the show and, and how listeners can check it out. Super. Thank you. Yeah, I um, uh, a couple of years ago, I, I had read a story in ESPN uh, that said that Ernst & Young had done some research with ESPN, with ESPN's backing. They were looking for the the common denominator. What is the what is the thing that most um, they were looking specifically at women who were C level executives, right? Chief executive, okay. chief financial, whatever C level executives at Fortune 500 companies. What was the most common denominator amongst those women in their history? And what they found was that the number one the, the number one um, factor was that they had been athletes that these women had played sports, had been involved in athletics, either on the high school or collegiate level, 94% of them had been athletes. 52% of them had played collegiately, which is incredible, right? If you think about that. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so I thought, gosh, you know, I'm always talking. Today, I, I've retired from Sports Illustrated. I write books, but I spend a lot of time at doing corporate speaking events. So I'm talking to businesses. I talk a lot about sports. Boy, this is the intersection of those two worlds, right? So I wanted to start interviewing executives who had played sports about how sports made them better leaders. And I've been blessed. I mean, we've had guests like uh, Ed Bastian, the CEO of Delta, right? Brian Moynihan, the CEO of Bank of America, uh, Bob Chapek, CEO of Disney, the Condoleezza Rice, mm. you know, former Secretary of State, who all have these amazing, fun sporting backgrounds, but sports made them better leaders and they can articulate how. And so it's kind of fun that I get a chance to interview people that I, I probably otherwise wouldn't be in communication with. Um, and sports is the driver in our conversation, which is a blast. Listeners, again, go to the show notes. I'll put a link how you can go check out the podcast Corporate Competitor. Don, how did speaking become part of your resume? So I started doing, um, when I was at Sports Illustrated, they had a speakers bureau. And um, if you were an advertiser, you could ask the magazine. They would send you one of the writers to speak at an event if you had something going on, if you were bringing all your salespeople together at the masters or, uh, or bringing all your best clients to the final four, whatever it might be. And um, most of the writers didn't enjoy doing it. And I understand it, right? Because we choose to become writers for a reason. Um, you know? And, uh, but I realized that I loved, uh, I loved the opportunity to learn about them, the audience in advance, and then try to find something that I had, witnessed or experienced that would be of value to them. 
as opposed to, you know, just standing up there. And, and then Tiger said to Phil, you know, <laughs> um, you shouldn't go to Saudi Arabia. Um, <laughs> they, they, uh, I tried not to just tell stories that had no particular need for the audience. And I got into it. I really did. And corporate companies were requesting that I, that I do these things for them. And, um, and so when I took the early retirement package at sports illustrated, one of the first things I knew I would be doing was, was speaking because I just, I loved, uh, I, I loved learning how to tell stories in a different form, which is what speaking is. Um, and it's made me a better writer in the process. What does it mean to you then to be connected with John Maxwell, who is named the number one leadership and management expert in the world by Inc. Magazine? Well, I don't know how anybody would ever not want to be connected to John Maxwell, right? This yeah. guy is, he's the, um, uh, if you're if you if you appreciate excellence, um, he is uh, he has got so much. He he just has it coursing through his veins. He 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 is great at everything he does. And so a few couple of years ago or a few years ago, I, I began a relationship with him, and um, he invited me to be on a couple of his stages uh, as and to tell stories and to teach lessons and. Um, and so when the opportunity pre presented itself last year for me to join his team as um, he picked five thought leaders that he was, he believed could help um, advance the conversation of leadership into the future. And to be one of those five is just one of the great honors of my life. And I will, you know, I, my father used to tell me, you can't do you can't do bad business with good people. And I'm in the presence of good people. You're in the presence of great people, I would say. I, I, as I told yes. you before we started, I'm a fan of your work. I think you do outstanding stuff. I think you're well-deserved to be connected with John Maxwell. I've had the opportunity to see him in person years ago and still to this day was floored by that speech. And seeing your name connected to that just makes sense in my mind. Well, it is, um, yeah, it's, you know, he's, you're, you're always looking for those people in your life where their audio and their video align, you know, where what they say and what they do. Um, there's, there's nothing incongruent about that, 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 that relationship. And John Maxwell is that guy. You've been a national board member for over seven years with make a wish foundation mm -hmm. and listeners. You're about to find out that Don is Really royalty. He's a big basketball junkie. You have a court at your home, but you became the sixth person to ever score on Michael Jordan in a one-on-one -on -one game to one with a 26-foot jumper at a charity event. Yes. Actually, yeah, we're back to Vegas again. It happened right there at Caesars. Uh, Jordan, uh, Jordan has an old man basketball camp that he hosts, and, um, and he does it at Caesars. It's pretty incredible. And yes, uh, a few years ago, he, he invites a hundred guys uh, who love the game to come play for several days, brings in incredible coaches, Shashevsky, Bayheim, you know, they're all of them are there and uh, they're coaching the us as players, as if we were real players. Um, and, uh, uh, but yes, on one of the mornings, he invites 20 guys to come out and he's going to let them go one-on-one -on -one with Michael but Michael starts with the ball and the first guy to score wins. And as you might imagine, Michael scores most often. Mm -hmm. And um, so when I got my chance, uh, I actually backed up a bit. Mike Krzyzewski actually said um, I was far enough away from him that I'd had to take a cab to go guard him if I wanted to. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, I backed up and Jordan actually looked at me and he said, are you really going to give me this shot? And I looked back and I said, I don't think you have it in you. <laughs> and, and everybody starts laughing. Jordan shakes his head, takes the shot, misses. And I got the rebound. And so I've got it outside the three point line and he's stepping up. And I look back and I said, aren't you going to return the favor as if I'd done him a favor by being a lousy defender. And he says, you know, I know you don't have that shot in you. And as he said that I jacked it. 
and from 26 feet, nothing but net. <laughs> and I became number six <laughs> on the list. And as my wife said, if I were really as smart as I think I am, I would never have touched a basketball again and made that my last shot. Unfortunately, I'm not that smart. I still, I still love playing. And as you said, I have a full court at my house and love it and invite friends over often. It's a great way to great way to keep moving and playing. The, the follow-up is how did he take that? Oh my gosh. Cause he's you competitive. Know, he's uh, there. So the picture that we use when I tell that story in a speech, you can see the, you can see the F bomb hanging off his lip <laughs> as he's talking, as he's looking at me. Right. Um, and uh, yeah, he, he kept asking for a rematch over the next two days. And I was like, dude, you had your shot. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, yes, I, I, I've, I've never given him the rematch. It's just, it's a, I, I am one and oh against Michael Jordan and I will hang on to that for a long, long time. I love it. That's a fantastic story. Listeners, he also has online courses. Enhance your pursuit and greatness as an individual and as a leader. A 30-day course for a journey to greatness. If you would tell our listeners about this course. Sure. Yeah, I just, so over the, tell me over the course of that career, you know, all these years, all these interviews like you, we've, we've done a lot of them. I've always asked um, each one of these high performers if they could name a habit that they, that they leaned on that had, that they believe was integral to their ability to be successful and great. And, um, over the, I, I did that. I asked that question about 2,500 times over the course of my career. And I, and I built a book called greatness back there. And also, uh, a course on the, the most consistent answers that came up when those great winners kind of got into that conversation. So it's a, it's a series of the, 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 the video course is just a series of 20 minute lessons on the habits of these high performing individuals and what, so it's a, it begins with a story. It goes to a lesson of something that I learned through the, and then, and then an application, how they can, how they can grow, how each of us has listened while listening to these kinds of discussions can grow and become better as a result. Go to donyeager.com. Once again, I'll put a link in the show notes. Don, I always feel like motivation is something that's needed daily because it fades over time. That's why there's so many motivational speakers out there because it's great when you leave and you're all pumped up and you're fired up. And a week later, everything is kind of dulled down again. Yeah, it's funny. I, I love Zig Ziglar was one of my favorite people in the whole world. And Zig used to have that great line. He said, yeah, uh, you know, um, motivational motivation is required daily, but so is showering. So, you know, um, don't, don't be bothered by the idea that you need to be refreshed and that they, that one presentation doesn't carry you for a year. Um, but I think that's a real key, right? Is how do people, uh, whether it's through podcasts or through reading or through, uh, YouTube videos or conversation, whatever it is, where are, are you going out to try to find uh, that next meal for you um, and uh, that next bit of nutrition? And, and that's the way I look at motivation is that it's not, you don't eat once a year, right? Um, you, you need to make sure that you're constantly seeking that motivation. And looking into your industry and your profession, what separates Don Yeager from everybody else? Oh gosh, uh, age. I mean, we've, we've, <laughs> um, no, I think, uh, I'll, I'll be honest. I mean, you know, I think what's probably is access, right? I mean, I've been blessed. And so I, I don't, I don't say this is because I'm better than anybody else. I just have been blessed with great access to, and then, uh, and then curiosity. I, I have not a single day in my life believed there isn't a, there isn't something I need to learn right now. And so, um, you know, we're back to that theme that I opened with, but I think access and curiosity, and if you're willing to mix those two things together um, with a little bit of skill and a storytelling and, and, a, and, a, and a desire to tell stories, which I love to do, uh, I think you can find, you can carve out a pretty nice little career. 
right there sounds like you just define the legacy of Don Yeager. Well, my We're not legacy done yet. is cur- they're currently 12 years old and 13 years old. They're, they're, uh, they're, 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 they're seventh and eighth graders. So that's the, that, that to me, that's where, that's where I want my legacy to be. They're, they're, they're pretty amazing. I'm, I'm a late in life dad. So I'm, I, I love the idea that I get a chance to experience fatherhood this late in life. It's pretty cool. Does everyone have leadership potential? I do. I believe that. You do? Yes. I believe that we all have. Now, could it be that your leadership potential is to lead yourself? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yes. Maybe that's the only lead, that's the only leadership um, that you that you might ultimately be able to execute on. Um, could it be to lead a family? Could it be to lead a group of friends? You know, leadership doesn't have to be defined corporately. Um, uh, could it be to lead people through, um, through the, through the, the the context of a podcast or whatever it might be, right? There's so many ways, but I do believe that leadership is available to all of us. Um, but you have to be, you have to be willing uh, to, to, to grow yourself in order to be able to grow your leadership. You have said before that the best advice you ever received was from John Wooden, who talked to you about doing regular measurement of the people you give your time to and making sure that you are surrounding yourself with people who are heading in the right direction and not just randomly giving your time to anybody who asks. How difficult is that? And I got to say thank you for taking time to be on my show and at least feeling that this was worth your time. Oh, it's definitely worth it. So it is difficult, but I think that that's, you know, I I think one of the things that you'll, you'll read over and over again is the importance of um, uh, learning how to say no, you know, how to say no to the, to things that don't, um, that aren't, aren't going to help you grow. And um, uh, I I think any opportunity um, to engage in conversation, to, to, try to find answers that you ask me questions I haven't really been asked before. And so that's good. And that's what we're looking for. Um, but yes, coach Wooden used to say all the time, you know, you're only as good as the people you choose um, to have in your inner circle. And that if you want to know what your potential for greatness is, look at your inner circle. And um, uh, so I'm constantly evaluating who I give my time to for exactly that reason. I'm a big proponent of the value of time because you can't get that time back in your life. You've spent it, especially as being, as you are a cancer survivor and losing my father to cancer. Time has taken on a whole new meaning for me when you get to the other side of it. I'm sure it has yourself. No question. I think that that, um, you know, you talk about a defining moment in my life. I mean, that, that, uh, um, yeah, cancer changed everything. I I mean, it's funny prior to prior to cancer, I had, I was rocking and rolling and doing incredible things in my life. And I had never stopped to think about what it would mean to be a father. Like I wanted, um, and it was cancer that kind of changed and flipped that switch for me, made, made finding the right relationship and the opportunity to become a dad uh, all the more important to me. And that's what, so I've, I've already shared a cup, you know, the, how much they mean to me, but cancer made it all the more real. Don, thank you so much for taking time being on my show before the lights and talking about your journey and some of the books you've written and some of the stories. I appreciate it. Tommy, thank you. I appreciate you, bud. Folks, if you would go to before the lights pod.com slash support, that's how you can join the members area and get the extra five, five more minutes of the interview coming up with Don Yeager still to come and follow me on Instagram at before the lights podcast. Thank you for listening to before the lights. I'm Tommy Canale. And until next time, everybody, a salute, a chin chin. <laughs>